Okay, well, let's kick off. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for another webinar. Um, I hope you all had a good week off for Australia's National Festival of um, Gambling and Drinking. Um, uh, really excited to kick off uh, a series of four webinars, um, explain, well, which is, which is an introduction to the energy system. This is a training that Nikki Eisen has been delivering um, to a bunch of participants in, in person. Um, this is the first time we've delivered it uh, via a webinar format, which of course means that this will be made available online. Um, Nikki's most recent event training, this was actually today, and I believe you've come back to back from training in Brisbane straight into this webinar. Yeah, so we've had about 20 people here in Brisbane uh, and it just finished five minutes ago. So, uh, yes, managed to make it work. Um, but I'm going to be a little bit frazzled by the end of tomorrow, I think. Um, anyway, thanks for that. Yep. Just, 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 a bit of, just a bit of housekeeping. So um, we will do questions at the end. Um, unless there's something which is preventing you from understanding, in which case, please use the Q&A panel, or if you can't find that, use the chat panel. Um, if there's something which is preventing you from understanding and moving forward, just, just put urgent or something in your message and we'll, we'll address that. This webinar is also being recorded and you can find recordings of webinars at c4ce.net.au. So over to you, Nikki. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I hope everything's okay. It's a little bit echoey in here. Um, so this is, as Tom said, is the That's first fine. of four Intro to the Energy System trainings. So um, today I'm going to be covering uh, the main parts of the electricity system and how they work, what is the National Electricity Market or the NEM, a brief history of electricity in Australia and who's who in the energy zoo. I'm going to whip through it quite quickly, so I'll probably talk for about 40 minutes. Um, and if I'm going long, uh, I'll, I'll probably cut off towards the end because um, there's quite a bit of content, uh, but hopefully you'll find it useful. So we're going to start with some electricity fundamentals. Uh, I'm going to intersperse my talking with some cute cartoons. This is my favourite. Um, but basically, to start boring, there are two fundamental or key design criteria that underpin our physical electricity system or any physical electricity system around the world. And they are peak demand or capacity or power. And when you thought, think about that, you should think about, as an analogy, the size of the pipes or the size of the infrastructure. Is the pipe or the pole or the wire big enough to meet that instantaneous peak demand at the time when everyone's pumping their air conditioners because it's been a three-day heat wave and things are really hot and it's an evening so everyone's turned on the TV. All of those uh, types of factors combine to create what we call peak demand and we need to have an electricity system that can deliver that capacity or power at any one instant to meet that really high demand. Uh, so that means we need big enough poles and wires and we need a big enough generation fleet. And the metric that we're talking about here is megawatts or kilowatts or even gigawatts. The second design principle or criteria is around energy. Is there enough water flowing through those pipes or electrons um, over a given time period? For example, one kilowatt of capacity used over an hour uh, e equals one kilowatt hour of energy. But you can use one kilowatt hour of energy in five minutes if you um, have something that's dry requiring 60 kilowatts, for example. Or, no, uh, 12 kilowatts. Sorry, my maths was out there. Um, so the measure of energy is megawatt hours, kilowatt hours, gigawatt hours. Uh, and really when you're thinking about... Uh, you know, does New South Wales or Queensland have enough energy for the next year? That's what we're talking about. If you're talking about building a new coal-fired power station or a new wind farm, you'll tend to talk about the megawatts of installed capacity that uh, it's 
uh, driving. So the different design criteria is delivered to different system outputs, but also we talk about them in different ways um, and they're useful metrics for different things. Uh, and I think that my, one of my key points is if you're writing a media release or something like that, please don't confuse the two of them. So the next part of electricity fundamentals is what are the key aspects of the electricity system? So we start off with um, traditionally really large electricity generators, so large coal-fired power station or that one at the top is Snowy Hydro, um, hundreds of megawatts if not a gigawatt or more of capacity. Um, they generate electricity and they send it down large poles and wires called transmission lines because typically these large generators are, are located at some distance from population centres. Like you know, the Hunter Valley is a couple of hundred kilometres from Sydney, for example. Sometimes those transmission lines look like that. And I think that's really relevant in, the case, in thinking about climate change and what a more resilient energy system looks like because these transmission lines are actually a point of weakness and can be blown over, um, which you know, cut, you know, creates blackouts and, and that type of thing. So we need to build a more resilient electricity system that is less reliant on these big transmission systems over time. The second part, or the third part of the network or, or the electricity system is the distribution system. They're the low voltage poles and wires um, that go out through suburbs and regional areas and that you see in your street. They're actually the most expensive part of the electricity system but uh, critical. Uh, then there's the end user. So all of those different component parts of the physical electricity system um, make up different parts of your electricity bill. So the wholesale cost, it's another way of saying the cost of generating electricity, accounts for about 22% of your electricity bill on average across Australia. Network costs, which are the combination of transmission and distribution costs, those two types of poles and wires, account for about 48%, so almost half of your electricity bill. The other components I'm going to come back to a little bit later on. So while there are two fundamental design criteria, we can also think about our electricity system now as working at two levels. The physical level, which is about the flow of electro electrons, and the financial level, which is about the flow of money. So this is the most complicated slide that I'm gonna to show today. Um, the bottom set of arrows and boxes is about the physical system. The top set of arrows and boxes are about the financial system that makes up our electricity sector. So at the bottom, it's pretty straightforward. It's what I just showed you in photos. So you've got generators on the left-hand side going with electricity flowing through transmission lines, through the distribution sector to the end customers. Increasingly, we're seeing more embedded generators. I'm sure some people watching this have solar on their roof. And so you're starting to feed electricity back into the distribution network. But at the moment, you can't feed electricity from the distribution network up to the transmission network. So there's really a one, our system was based on a one-way flow of electricity. Then if we look to the, the um, section above, this is the financial flow. So we as electricity customers pay our electricity retailer. You might be with PowerShop or AGL or Red Energy or Enova. Um, and what they do is they aggregate all the costs um, and they pass them on to you uh, in your electricity system, uh, on your electricity bill. So what they will do is they will purchase electricity, the wholesale um, price, through one of two ways. One, they can um, bid in uh, or, or purchase electricity through the national electricity market or the wholesale market. I'm going to explain how that works shortly. Or they can directly contract and purchase electricity directly from a generator. Um, these are called power purchase agreements, for example. Typically or historically, there's been a one-way flow of, of fun money from electricity customers or through retailers back to generators. Also, retailers um, pass through the cost of um, paying for your the distribution and transmission or those network costs as well. So, Nikki, I'm going to ask a couple of questions just to clarify some points. 
Embedded generators, why is that called embedded? Um, so yeah. why embedded generator? Well, because it's embedded in the distribution system and uh, it's close to where uh, consumers are, it's on your roof or it's in the nearby distribution network, but it's just one term, decentralised generator, local generator, rooftop generator, those are all similar terms. And the national energy market, is, are you going to cover the I'm going to cover the that. national energy market? I'm going to cover yeah, that. Great. All right. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Um, moving on, so how the national electricity market works or what it is. So it's a bunch of things. The first thing it is, is one of the longest interconnected energy systems in the world. It goes from actually the Daintree River all the way down to southern Tasmania and then west to Port Augusta. Uh, it's uh, previously, electricity is actually under our constitution, the responsibility of state governments. And what happened was each state government had its own electricity system and its own set of institutions. So what it is, is also the standardization of electricity rules and institutions across different states, as well as the interconnection of those different state-based electricity systems. Um, it's also this wholesale energy market. So it was really, the NEM was about introducing competition into electricity. Um, it's about 45 or maybe 47 mega, uh, thousand megawatts or 47 gigawatts of capacity. So that's the generation fleet. There are about 9 million customers, that's small businesses, households and large energy users that are connected to the NEM. It's not the Northern Territory or Western Australia. So this is where it is. The NEM is in all of those places. Those lines, squiggly lines are the transmission lines. They're not the distribution lines. If you tried to map the distribution lines, you would just see a massive colour. Um, in Western Australia, we have the Swiss, the Southwest Interconnected System. Um, in the Northern Territory, uh, you have the Darwin to Catherine grid. Um, and then what you have is a series of smaller grids, um, say in Alice Springs, in Broome, and then hundreds of communities that have what we call remote error power supply systems. And Australia was one of the, the main places in the Western world that developed the ability to do these remote error power supply systems. But we haven't been very good, I don't think, in replacing them from diesel to solar. There's been various efforts, but more can and should be done. So people asked about uh, the wholesale energy market or the NEM, this sort of competitive market. What I don't have a slide to show it, but what I, I will talk you through it. So what happens, I want you to imagine a curve, like a normal bell curve, and that represents the electricity demand that we have every day. Say the electricity demand every day for one state was 1,000 kilowatt hours. That's way, way too small, but I'm just using hypothetical numbers. So what happens is every five minutes, the Australian energy market operator, who I'll explain soon, um, I'll just uh, move to a more pretty slide. What, what happens is every five minutes, AMO, the Australian energy market operator, says we have this amount of demand for electricity and then invites generators to bid into the wholesale market. What will happen is that they will um, bid in, this is how much capacity I can provide or how much energy we, I can supply in the next five minutes. So it might be 200 kilowatt hours or it might be 500 kilowatt hours. And at what cost? So typically solar and wind go into the stack at the bottom and I'm not talking about rooftop solar here, I'm talking about um, large scale solar um, because they have a low marginal cost. So they might say they've got 200 kilowatt hours of generation they can supply at two cents a kilowatt hour. Coal will bid in after that. They'll say, oh, to cover our fuel costs, we need to bid in at four kilowatt, four cents a kilowatt hour, but we can supply, six, supply 600, uh, 600 kilowatt hours. Then the final two generators are two gas generators. One's got a good gas supply contract and one's got a bad gas supply contract. Both of them can supply 200 get, uh, uh, kilowatt hours, making up the, the full thousand kilowatt hours that we need to meet our demand. And, but one of them can bid in at 
eight cents and the other can bid in at 12 cents. The one that bids in at eight cents gets to generate electricity. The one that bids in at 12 cents has to turn off. And then all of the people, uh, all of the, the generators in the stack, so the solar and wind at the bottom, the coal and the gas, all get paid eight cents a kilowatt hour for the electricity they provide in that five minute interval. It gets a little bit more complicated because while you bid in every five minutes, the settlement period for the costs is averaged over half an hour. People might have heard about the five minute rule change. This is about going, you don't just want to um, bid in on five minute intervals, but settle on five minute intervals as well. Um, so that's basically how the, the uh, wholesale market works. And people might have heard of the term the merit order effect. What that means is that the merit order is the, the price order. Um, solar and wind can bid in lowest. And the more capacity or the more energy they bid in, the more they push out coal and gas from the stack. And that means that you start to cut into the business model of uh, coal and gas, gas generators. I'm going to move on. I'm sorry I don't have slides for that, but hopefully you've got a grasp of it. Um, I'm going to take you through a brief history of electricity in Australia, or at least in the NEM. I'm going to focus more on New South Wales because that's what I know, but I'm going to do a little bit of a state-by-state -state analysis. So, in the early 20th century, when we started to see electrification, we had a whole bunch of local electricity boards, local councils or other um, cooperatives or uh, in local institutions um, built uh, electricity generators and connected um, households and farms to them. In fact, my great-grandfather, Colin White, was one of the people who founded the Mitchell Shire Electricity Alliance um, that electrified Bathurst and around there. Then what happened in the mid-20th century is you started to see aggregation. State governments went, oh, well, some places are getting really good supply, other places aren't getting supplied by electricity at all. In a modern society and economy, electricity is becoming a fund an essential service, so we need to have more uniform uh, provision of electricity. So we're going to create what we call vertically integrated state-owned electricity utilities. These combine a the generators, the transmission companies, the distribution uh, networks, and the retailing function all in a single organisation. And there was a variation of that type of theme in each state around the country. It wasn't exactly all the same, but it was similar. Then in the 90s, as part of the wave of neoliberal reform, you saw of different uh, essential services, the telcos, uh, this happened to Telstra and others, but we saw the liberalisation of the electricity system. Um, this meant starting to interconnect different states, uh, the split up of those vertically integrated utilities into different state-owned companies, the retail companies, the generation companies, the distribution companies. Um, and then over time, we saw privatisation. So, in 1998, the NEM, the wholesale market, started, and it, that meant the marketization of electricity. Competition uh, occurred for the first time in the electricity sector in 1998. And that, what that meant is we went from an electricity system that was planned, where a central planning authority within the utility would go, oh, we've got this much demand, you guys need to turn on and you guys need to turn on and, and we'll just manage the costs because it's all publicly owned, to splitting up the different generators and going, now you have to compete uh, to sell your electricity and we'll allow new privately owned entrants into the market. So th this, these Hillmar reforms were the foundation, the basis of the establishment of the NEM. So what's happened is different states have taken that marketization, competition uh, and privatization agenda to different levels. In Victoria and then followed by South Australia, they separated the, ver ver the, the vertically integrated utilities into these component parts. Uh, they privatized, they sold them all off 
um, and they introduce both wholesale and then retail competition, so competition between retailers for customers. In New South Wales, we've had the structural separation. They've sold some of it. We're, we're in the final round of sailing. In Queensland, they've had some degree of structural separation and then more structural integration. You've had retail competition in southeast Queensland and com wholesale competition across the whole state. In Western Australia and Tasmania, there's been structural separation and some competition, but not a heap. In um, Northern Territory, it's not big enough. The grids and the, the number of customers aren't big enough to, to um, allow for competition at this point in time. So what happened in New South Wales is that between 2008 and 2011, we saw the sale of the state-owned retailers. So Country Energy, which was in regional New South Wales with the state-owned retailer, they then sold their electricity, uh, the, the retail business to Origin Energy. So if you live in regional New South Wales and you haven't changed your um, uh, provider in the last 10 years, you'll definitely be with Origin Energy. Energy Australia was sold to True Energy that reformed as a uh, renet branded as back to Energy Australia and, and, and so on. And these similar types of things happened in other states around the country. Then we've seen the sale of state owned energy electricity generators, but really it was not actually the generators, it was the power from those generators. Um, and what you'll see is that the people who bought the generators are the same organisations that bought the retail businesses, that's the basis of Gentailers. And now, 2016, 2017, we're seeing the sale of network companies in New South Wales. In Queensland, they stopped the sale of networks and a lot of the electricity infrastructure in Victoria and South Australia, it's all already privatised. So that's sort of a bit of a history of where we are. Um, I haven't talked about renewable energy and how that's factored into the history. I will talk about that in next week's webinar. My final thing that I want to talk through in the last uh, 10 minutes is who's who in the energy zoo. So who are the key actors? The first and the top most important, the key decision-making body in the energy space is the COAG Energy Council. It is the... Uh, it's a function of COAG uh, and it includes the representatives of state electric, uh, energy ministers from every state and territory and the federal government. Uh, the resource minister can also turn up if they would like. It was formally called SCUR and formally before that the Ministerial Council on Energy. It's had a few different names. Uh, so COAG Energy Council, ultimately responsible for making the decisions about how our electricity system works. There's a joke in politics that says, send things to COAG if you want it to die. That basically means it's really difficult to get COAG to agree to anything. So that means electricity market reform is extremely slow because you have to get every single organize, uh, state government and the federal government signed up to it. I think it's important to know, I said before that uh, State governments are responsible for electricity provision. Um, so legislatively, the NEM is enacted through state law. We have the National Electricity Law, which is passed um, simultaneous legislation starting in South Australia and going through all of the other NEM states. Um, so that's how the agreement from COAG to marketise and uh, pri uh, our energy system and interconnect our energy system, our electricity system um, was established legislatively. Under that legislation, they established three main market bodies. The first and central one is the Australian Electricity Market Operator. They have responsibility for running the wholesale market, for making sure the uh, system is operating uh, effectively and safely. Um, and they are also responsible for planning future needs of our electricity system. So they, they project how much electricity demand there might be in two or three years' time, and traditionally they've been pretty bad at that. But they also do transmission network planning and a whole range of things like that. I said there is a national electricity law. Underneath that law sits thousands of pages of rules and regulations. Those rules and regulations are governed through the Australian Energy Market Commission, or AEMC. 
They are the rule maker. So if you or I think that one of the rules is wrong, we can put in a rule change proposal to the AMC uh, and they will run a rule change process if they think it is um, important enough to do so. Uh, they are, it's traditionally a fairly slow process. Um, the five minute rule is a, an example of the type of rule change that's being proposed. Uh, but they're also the advisor. If COAG, Energy Council or any of its constituent members have um, advice that they want, so for example, how could we combine emissions with, um, with a reliable future? Um, they would ask and they have asked AMC. Uh, that's proved to be somewhat problematic, but it is the system that we have. In addition, the final main uh, energy market body that we have is the Australian Energy Regulator. They're responsible for enforcing the rules and particularly they do price determinations on our network um, companies. So basically as part of the electricity market reform process in the last 20 years, it was determined that um, generators and retailers could compete in a competitive um, market uh, but the network companies were monopolies. We don't need two sets of poles and wires owned by two different companies. So that means they need to be regulated very closely and that's the job for AER. So every five years the AER says this is how much you network company X can spend upgrading your, uh, uh, your infrastructure. And that is actually the source of the gold plating issue. Um, I'm not going to go into gold plating right now, but suffice to say it's, it's a combination of how AMO predicted electricity demand would go up, how network companies proposed to, uh, how much infrastructure they proposed to build, and then how much infrastructure the AER allowed them to build. And then the other thing is, it's a pretty sweet gig running a network company. You get a guaranteed return on your investment. So the AER allows you to have a certain amount of profit on any dollar that you spend. The thing is that every dollar of profit comes from us as consumers. So AER is essentially allowing network companies to spend our money as electricity consumers. They, the AER also, uh, they're part of the ACCC, so um, they sit under that sort of competition law. State governments and territory governments and the Commonwealth governments also have a bunch of powers that affect how our electricity system works, from climate change policies to planning policy to taxation policy and legislation, and the list goes on. And all of that impacts on how our electricity, our stationary electricity system functions. So those are the key actors. But there are a few more to go through. Um, so uh, maybe before I go into um, any of these, are there any uh, questions, Tom, any questions of clarification that I should be covering off on? No, look, I can't think of any. Um, but of course, I'm quite familiar with this stuff. And, and no questions are coming through. So um, people, please do get your questions in to the Q&A panel and don't be shy. Um, your question will be answered. Um, I'll you. Okay, so keeping on going through, um, apologies for the quality of some of these slides. Um, there are retailers, they sell our electricity to us. They also manage risk because that wholesale market that I was telling, about, telling you about can actually go up to $14,000 a megawatt hour, which is something you know, which is an exorbitantly high amount. Um, and so if we were to pay that as consumers, we would not be very happy. So their role is to manage the risk of that financial risk. That was really introduced when you started to introduce the marketization and the competition into electricity. Um, so we've got the retailers, then you have generators. We have a couple of generators, uh, generation companies like Stanwell and Delta Electricity that just really own fossil fuel um, generators. Then you've got some generators that uh, just own renewable generators. So Infogen and Pacific Hydro, they're renewable energy developers, but they also own and operate a number of wind and solar farms as well. Then you have the gen tailors, and we have the big three. 
So Energy Australia Origin and AGL, they control about 60%, uh, own about 60% of the generation fleet uh, and a, have a significant amount of the market share for um, the for, of retail customers. And so they've sort of re-vertically integrated th this retail function and generation function. They don't, they don't supply network services, but they, can, they do both the selling and the generation of energy. And that means that they can uh, play, you know, they can manage costs and risks more effectively than just retailers or generators by themselves. This can lower costs. But if they have a large amount of market power, as they do, there's also concerns about uh, the ability to price gouge. It's not just the big three that are gen tailors. PowerShop is a gen tailor. Um, they have a, a generation arm called Meridian that has, owns a number and operates a number of wind farms and uh, I think a couple of small hydro projects as well. Red Energy um, is the retail arm of Snowy Hydro, which is actually still government owned. So, you know, there's a whole range of different actors in this space. In the retail space, there's anywhere upwards of 25 to 35 or more retailers in New South Wales, Victoria, um, and South East Queensland. There are, uh, there are some in South Australia, but less. Um, and then in places like Western Australia, there are a few retailers that compete with a government-owned retailer, but less, um, much less. Then we've got the transmission companies. There's one transmission company per state. Uh, in New South Wales, it's Transgrid. Uh, in Queensland, it's Powerlink. Uh, and the list goes on. Uh, in, then there's the distribution companies. Um, in New South Wales, there are three, Essential Energy, Osgrid and Endeavour. In Queensland, there are two, Energex and Ergon. Uh, in South Australia, there's one, SAPN. In Victoria, there's four. Uh, some of these distribution networks are, and transmission network companies are privately owned. Some of them are publicly owned. Uh, so those are sort of the key players, but then there are a bunch of other players. We have industry peak bodies. So the Australian Energy Council was the, com, was the coming together of the Energy Retailers Association and the Energy Supply Association of Australia. So really represents those gen tailors. Uh, you've got the Energy Networks Association. Um, they're doing some really interesting stuff. Next week when I, or the webinar that I talk about 100% renewables, I'm gonna talk about a, a renewable study that they did with CSIRO. In the renewable space, uh, there's a lot of competition around energy bodies. The main one is probably the Clean Energy Council. Um, they probably have the most coverage of different renewables technologies. They also provide services around accreditation and other things, but you also then have the Solar Council, the Solar Energy Industries Association, APVI. APVI used to be play more of an industry role, now it's more a think tank um, and data supplier. They have rate maps and real-time data of um, the amount of solar electricity being generated from a rooftop level. The final key industry body is the Energy Users Association of Australia. They represent the large electricity users, um, irrigators, and a range of others, and they're doing some interesting things right now. Final slide around the different actors, uh, and I've got one minute to go. Uh, you've got state regulators. They're important because, so in New South Wales it's IPART, uh, in Queensland, it's the Queensland Competition Authority. In Victoria, it's the Essential Services Commission of Victoria. They're important because they set uh, the either mandated or suggested feed-in tariff for rooftop solar. Uh, in Victoria, it's mandated. In other states, it's suggested. Uh, you have consumer protection organisations. So consumer protection organisations are critical. Um, I mentioned the Australian electricity law or the national electricity law. The objective of our electricity system as written into that law is that the electricity system should operate in the long-term interests of consumers. In all of the description of the different industry organisations and bodies involved in the electricity system, I don't think I've talked about consumers once. 
So recognising that the aim was to, uh, of the energy market was to operate in the interests of consumers, but no one was really advocating or representing consumers' interests, two, about two years ago, uh, COAG Energy Council established the Energy Consumers Australia that provides funding and advocacy for electricity consumers, um, funding for research, funding for advocacy, and they do a bunch themselves. Then in each jurisdiction you have ombudsmen um, that are places and organisations that you can go to if you've got complaints as a consumer. So I had an exorbitantly high electricity bill uh, recently, which was, I believe, faulty. So I called up the EWOM, the Energy and Water Ombudsman in New South Wales, to complain and that complaint process is going through. In addition, you've got coal and gas suppliers, you've got financiers, you've got other actors like CSIRO or ARENA, who's the grant funding body around renewables. There's renewable installers, project developments, technology and equipment companies, startups, Reposit Power as an example, and a range of others, you know, all of which are coming into this uh, energy ecosystem. But I've tried to pull out some of the key actors, probably more incumbent actors, to get a sense of where the electricity system has come from. So when next week I talk, and uh, the next couple of weeks I talk about renewables, you can start to compare it to the new actors with and the new way the electricity system is headed compared to with how it's uh, started off as. I'm going to finish up there and um, put it out for any questions. All right, thank you, Nikki. We don't have any questions coming through. Um, normally at this point I'll ask questions, but um, it all seems pretty straightforward to me. Um, one thing I know people get confused about, so let's talk about this as one of the last slides you, the last slide you spoke about. What's the difference between ARENA and Clean Energy Finance Corporation? They're both federal government funded initiatives. What, yes. What's the difference between them? So ARENA is a grant making body. They essentially give free money. So basically, as a, if I put an application to ARENA and say, I want to do this research or I want to commercialise this project or, or demonstrate this technology, I want to get $500,000 and I'm going to match it with $500,000 from somewhere else and it's going to deliver these outcomes and drive renewable energy in innovation and deployment in Australia. Uh, and Arena says, oh, okay, yep, we've got a few checks and balances, but that sounds good. We'll give you $500,000. You've got to write, report to us, um, but we don't expect our money back. So Arena is a grant-making body. The Clean Energy Finance Corporation is the government's green bank. So it's for more mature technologies that are just starting to come down the cost curve um, and be more uh, deployable. And so if I was a renewables proponent and I had a, you know, it had been through commercialisation, it had been tested a bunch of times and we're starting to reach scale, I might go to the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and ask for a loan and say, you know, I'm going to deploy this amount of renewables, I need this much money and you're going to get it back at this rate of interest. So essentially CFC acts as a bank and the reason... Uh, it's been so successful and useful is that it's been able to provide a lower cost of finance to some other uh, commercial banks like NAB or others, but also it can help de-risk investments for other commercial banks and educate them in how to finance renewables in the process. So typically, CEFC will partner with another finance provider and they will take you know, a lower interest rate or they will go, you know, take a slightly more risky position and then enable other finance institutions to invest in that renewables project. But all of it is on the basis of you know, a risk profile and the expectation that you are, there's a, a good, uh, you know, there's not too high a level of risk and that I'm going to get a return on my, uh, that CFC will get their money back plus interest. Okay, that's great. So why don't you tell us where we're going next? We've just, we've just done who's who in the zoo. What, what will we be doing in the next webinar? 
Uh, I can't remember. Um, All right. So, so, uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The next, the next webinar is. Uh, I didn't have it here. Where did it go? Oops. Just literally looked at it. There it is. Um, what are the key policies and how do they work? So, yes, yeah, so next week I'm going to be talking about energy policies. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the renewable energy target, feed-in tariffs, the proposed NEG, uh, some community energy policy, um, and a few other key policies that we're going to need to drive the transition to clean energy and, you know, step through how they work so that you have a, a good understanding from a practical level and from an advocacy level. Then I think and then the after, that, after that, the following to, yep, yep, energy technologies, and then finishing up on how do we get to 100% renewable energy. Yeah. So the, the, the third one we'll talk about what are the different energy technologies, the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, and give people a good yeah. sense from a technical perspective. Um, and then the final one is how do we get to 100% renewables? So that will be less about how do we make the transition and more what does a 100% renewable electricity system look like? But if you have a sense of what it looks like, then you can start to understand what are the different component parts that we need to be working on right now. Great. All right, Nikki, well, thank you very much. And we'll see you next week, same time, same place.